Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual program this morning. Lauren is joining us from Mommy Bay State Park. She is a naturalist there, and she is going to be talking about hibernation fascination. Thank you so much, Lauren, for continuing to provide programs for us. Of course more than happy to. And like Liz has mentioned earlier, um, if you have any questions during this presentation, please feel free to ask them. You don't have to wait till the end or anything like that. I'm more than happy to uh, answer them as we go. But um, again, my name is uh, Lauren Stewart. I'm a naturalist here at Mommy Bay State Park. And today we're going to be talking about hibernation. Tis the season. Um, so we may have been noticing that, you know, of course, we're starting to get our fall color. Everything's starting to cool down. And um, though we have changes in the, or a little bit of our landscape and the weather, the animals also have to undergo some changes to basically deal with what is Ohio winter. So um, we're gonna be talking specifically about some adaptations that these animals have. Uh, and there's a, there's a few different methods that animals have to deal with or not, not even to bother with winter in general. And so we're gonna discuss some of those as well as the different animals and what they do. So we'll get right start, get, go ahead and get started. So a big question is, let's see if my, there we go. What is hibernation? Um, a lot of times when people think of hibernation, they think of like an animal sleeping. But um, hibernation is actually, it's a specific method of survival to deal with winter. And it's actually, it's, it's very, very specific. A lot of times what we call hibernation really isn't hibernation. And essentially it is basically, it's a state of inactivity, which I know a lot of times like this time of year, especially like around Thanksgiving and Christmas, like uh, for all that eating, we don't really do a whole bunch, but hibernation in particular has to do with essentially you're having hormonal and metabolic changes. So it is like, it is truly a completely different state that the animals go into. Um, you cannot shake an animal awake during hibernation. They are truly completely out of it. They're almost in a sense, they are like they're in a, uh, a state of suspended animation. They're going to have a lower body temperature. They're going to really slow breathing and they're going to have a very, very low metabolic rate, which is basically allows them kind of to go through that state um, and deal with winter without having to use all of their energy because it's a lot harder to forage and find food during winter time. So why would you hibernate? So I know we have to deal with the cold here in Ohio. Um, thankfully, we have modern technology with our outerwear. It's food's a lot easier for us to find in general than it is for the wildlife. But basically, it's to escape the cold. Um, a lot of the animals that hibernate are eating things that don't necessarily are going to be growing during the cold season, or they're gonna be really, really hard to find in the low supply. And if that's the case, if they were awake and active as normal, they'd literally starve to death. Um, some of these animals, they um, have adaptations just to deal with the cold, but not in the sense of deal with it through the entire season. So basically they're trying to escape the cold and all what comes with it. And a big thing is that preserving that energy when food is scarce. Because in the winter time, in general, food is going to be a lot more scarce than it is in late spring, early summer. And it allows them to live in landscapes and climates that you wouldn't necessarily think they'd be able to expand their range ranges to. Because say there's this animal that usually eats insects. Well, come winter time, the insects aren't going to be out and active. So you would think, well, maybe this animal really can't live this far north because the insects are all gone during the wintertime. What are they going to eat? But if they're able to do things like hibernate or other techniques to survive through the wintertime, that they can actually be able to deal with the changes coming in the winter as well as expand their range. And there's also an, an opposite. So hibernation is dealing with winter and dealing with the cold. There's something called estivation. And that is actually to deal with the heat um, because heat can actually cause just as many problems as a cold can. Um, if you think of the desert, um, desert is barren. It's hot there. Food is hard to find. 
And sometimes in the summertime in certain areas, food can be very, very scarce because there's very little water. There's a very little shade or shelter. And so estivation is kind of what some, some of the animals that live in the more um, tropical or hotter climates deal with to escape heat. So there is, there's a polar opposite of hibernation as well. So types of hibernation. So hibernation specifically deals with the metabolic changes. And there's some different kind of subcategories that aren't technically what we consider the main hibernation, but basically this is types of methods to deal with being cold. Um, a big thing that you're gonna find in our um, amphibians and reptiles is brumation. So hibernation is specifically hormonal and metabolic changes that it's usually related to daylight length. It's not related to necessarily the actual temperature. It's related to the length of the day because as we know, as we go into winter, it's getting a lot darker, a lot faster, especially the farther north you go. And um, so the sun is setting at five versus the sun is setting at almost 10 o'clock like it does towards the summer solstice. So brumation is what reptiles use. So they're not undergoing the metabolic changes that our mammals are because reptiles are cold-blooded and can't generate their own body heat. They're really dependent on whatever the temperature is outside. Well, in the wintertime, it doesn't work out so great for them. So what they do to deal with it is basically go in a similar state like hibernation, but they are, it's a lot more flexible. It's called brumation. And basically it's inactivity that you'll see in reptiles and amphibians during the winter time for extended period of times because it's so cold outside. But the really interesting thing part about brumation is the animals, they're basically awake the entire time. They're literally, they're just too cold to move. Um, they, a lot of times they basically hunker down and hope for the best, hope they're below the frost line. A lot of our reptiles bury themselves in the winter, uh, turtles in particular. And they basically have to like, fingers crossed, I don't freeze to death but they're essentially awake. They're, they're not in the true like state of sleep like the mammals are during hibernation. And what's interesting because it's tied to temperature, if we have a 60 degree day in January, we'll see garter snakes out, we'll see frogs out. Um, if we have a 60 day degree in January, we're not gonna see our um, groundhogs out, our woodchucks out because they're truly hibernating. It's metabolic changes that are triggered by hormones. It's not triggered by temperature. So that's the big difference between brum brumation and true hibernation. There's also a thing <clears throat> that insects tend to do. So insects are also cold-blooded. So they're um, not able, they're ectotherms, they're not able to generate their own body heat. So again, wintertime, not the best time for them. But what they can do is basically literally go into state of suspended animation. And they basically stop their development. They literally pause, it's called diapause well-named because they literally pause um, and kind of basically shut it down. And, uh, and it's, um, um, the nice part is it's unfavorable environmental conditions. So it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be cold. It could be all of a sudden there's a water famine or there's a food famine and they can literally go like, eh, okay, we'll, we'll shut it down for a little bit and wait till conditions get better. Some insects more than others, but a lot of times you'll see this like in moths where they basically um, go from caterpillar to pupa and that pupa they overwinters. So it's overwinters, it's not developing, it's waiting till conditions get better till the temperature's warmer for it to be able to function really as it metamorphosizes into a moth. So insects have a way to do it. They take it one step above the reptiles where literally they stop everything. And what a lot of times um, animals that don't necessarily truly hibernate or they're warm blooded, so they're not going to do diapause or brumation, they do something called torpor. And it's basically you slow down. So this is more accurate for like me during Thanksgiving after I've eaten a whole bunch. Ah, it's cold outside, don't really want to do anything, but it's not, not to the full extent that some do. But torpor is basically like the animal slows down during the winter time. They're, um, they're not going to be as active. They're not, they're pretty much going to literally chill out. And you, you'll see this sometimes as animals building up to hibernation, but torpor is basically the animal expending less energy. The heart rate is lowered, respiration is lowered. And with that, they're using 
um, their metabolism is kind of slowing down, they're using less energy and it's a really important method and actually a few different bird species that we'll discuss a little bit. So a big thing to remember is brumation in occurs in cold-blooded animals. So <clears throat> our animals that, um, that we see here often at Mommy Bay, we're seeing a lot of amphibians and snakes and uh, amphibians, reptiles, including snakes and turtles because we're in a wetland. So we're gonna see a lot of frogs and we're gonna see a lot of turtles and we do have quite a few different species of snakes. And how they deal with the cold is brumation. And one of the big ones is, here's our Eastern fox snake. Um, the Eastern fox snake, even though they're living in a fairly wet environment, what's really neat about them is they're able to survive fairly well here. Um, they're gonna have to find an area that's relatively dry. So it might take them, they might have to go a little bit farther than anticipated. Um, and they are kind of, kind of, they're gonna look for dead logs or dead trees with logs. They're gonna go underneath buildings. Um, sometimes we find these guys in the wintertime in our nature center. Uh, well, when I can't blame them, it's warmer. There's sometimes in the, in the wintertime, we'll also get mice here that are looking for shelter as well. There's sometimes food. Um, but for the most part, they're going to basically hunker down somewhere, hopefully either below the frost line or insulated enough that the uh, freezing temperatures aren't going to affect them and hunker down over the winter until it gets relatively above freezing consistently. Um, we usually do not see these guys active until later in May because it stays pretty cold here. Sometimes we'll see them as early as mid-May, but oftentimes it's not, we don't really see them until Memorial Day and then they start right into their breeding season in June. So they have to deal with the conditions here. And one of my favorite, favorite, favorite snakes, the Eastern hognose, um, they also do the same thing. So Eastern hognose snakes are 100% drama. They aren't as common here as the um, Eastern fox snake is, but these snakes play possum. So they're one of my favorites. They, are technically venomous. They are. They do not have venom significant to humans. Um, they have rear fixed fangs. They kind of have to chew on their food um, in order to inject the venom. But their food is amphibians. So we're not on the list. Um, they rarely, if ever, bite humans. Um, but they're all bluff. And what they'll do is when they feel threatened, is the this one is showing. They'll flatten out their neck. They kind of look like false cobras. Um, and they'll do, they're really good bluffers. They'll basically headbutt you acting like they're going to strike you, but they don't ever open up their mouths. And if that doesn't work, they literally play dead. So they'll roll over, stick their tongue out. They'll even like poop on themselves. It's, it's very dramatic. They do, they're very committed to their act, but they're really cool snakes. Um, and they do the same thing to deal with wintertime as our Eastern fox snake does. They have to go through brumation. So as it starts to get cold, they're starting to look for places to um, over winter. And when it gets colder, specifically for these reptiles, their metabolism is slowing down anyways. They actually cannot digest their food if it gets too cold. They actually, as the days get shorter and it gets cooler at night, they stop eating as much. Even the snakes that we have here at the center that are in more temperature controlled conditions, just with the daylight hours changing, and it get cooling cooler at night, we'll notice them. They actually fast themselves for almost three months here, even in their more controlled, controlled conditions. So it's pretty innate, but it is very much so temperature um, determined as well. Another one, so this also affects lizards. So here's an Eastern fence lizard, which are more common in Southern Ohio, but um, they do the same thing. They basically have to figure out a place to overwinter um, that is gonna not be at risk of allowing them to freeze. And so the Eastern box turtles take it a little bit farther um, than some of the other reptiles. These guys bury themselves, like literally they will dig down and bury themselves. And what's neat about the box turtle is they bury themselves for a couple different reasons. So one of them is for their overwintering, they get below the frost line. Um, the downside is of burying yourself, you have to make sure you're not burying yourself with a in a place that has a high water table because you don't want to drown while you're cold and really can't move but you also uh, the water may freeze and uh, you're going to need a nice dry spot to stay out of that frost but these box turtles often live at the edge of prairies and how prairies usually stay prairies 
uh, is because of fire. So another reason why these box turtles bury themselves is basically to avoid fire as well. So prairies are more open grassland and they stay grasslands because the fires take out the uh, emergent growth of the trees. So another method of these box turtles dealing with their habitat is burying themselves to deal with fire and then also to deal with the cold winters that come ahead. Uh, so now most reptiles are going to be inactive during the winter time. We do have a couple exceptions, uh, the mud puppy being one of them. They're actually most active um, in the late, early to late fall and sometimes even through the winter. They're actually breeding during this time, which is not typical of more cold-blooded animals. Um, them being aquatic, the mud puppies being aquatic, um, kind of is tied to that. So the colder the water is, the more oxygen there is in the water. So it is actually best for them to, to breed when the water is cold, but not freezing, obviously, because there's enough, there's a lot more oxygen. It's basically better water for them to be more active because there's more oxygen for them to be able to take in. And oftentimes um, the animals that live in streams like that, that keep moving, there's not gonna be, the water's not gonna have a chance to be frozen. And there's insects and other food for them adapt that is adapted to the colder conditions that they're able to eat. So the males, the male and female are breeding during this time where most animals, most at least reptiles and amphibians are starting to get ready to basically go into brumation during the entire time. So it's interesting. So what's different about the mud puppies though, is they do their breeding. The fertilization is actually internal, which oftentimes it isn't for amphibians. Basically, the female lays the egg, the, may, the male uh, sprays the spermazoa, and then they're fertilized. So the female basically takes the packet, holds on to it until spring. And so then the eggs are kind of, they're not quite fertilized yet. They breed, but they don't really fertilize them until spring. And they can raise from about 20 eggs to almost 200 eggs. So um, it can be highly variable in terms of how many young they may have. But what's interesting about these guys, they're pretty long lived. Um, it can take um, four to six years for them to even reach sexual maturity. So um, being in that colder water slows everything down. Um, so it takes them longer to grow, but at the same time, they live a lot longer. So the marbled salamander. Um, the marbled salamander, um, they're going to be more found in wet areas on land. So they're going to overwinter beneath like leaf litter, fallen logs, sometimes even in old animal burrows. So again, they have to figure out how to deal with making sure they're below the frost line. Um, but a big thing it is th with these guys is they are um, amphibians. So they have to stay a lot wetter than say the reptiles or mammals do, they're really more tied to water. So they have to deal with the summer. It's just as hard for them as it is in the wintertime when there's a lot less water. So they go through excavation or basically the equivalent of brumation in the summertime. And there's some animals that just have to have the big trophy for dealing with winter. Um, the wood frog in particular. The wood frog is native as far north as Alaska. Um, and they basically have a, um, it's been like antifreeze in their body. Um, they can freeze 65% of their body and still thaw and be okay and don't experience cellular death. Um, essentially, they have to basically make sure they're, they're in an area where their, their main internal organs don't freeze, like the important ones. And they're able to overwinter as far north as Alaska, which is crazy because they essentially only have three and a half months of time to breed and feed before winter comes right back or gets cold enough to come right back around and have to do it all over again. Um, the wood frog is, we do have them here. Um, and they are actually one of the first frogs we're gonna hear in the springtime because they are just more than well suited to deal with uh, the nice fun winter time that other frogs don't. So essentially how they deal with um, freezing is their liver basically helps convert uh, different sugars 
into glucose and that glucose um, because it's from coming from the liver and not like from our pain, like it does with our pancreas, it and it is spreading throughout their whole body differently and kind of keeping those cells from um, completely freezing, dehydrating, shrinking, and causing that cellular damage. So basically, it's acting as a nice antifreeze, a nice buffer to um, keep them alive. And even though they might be not completely frozen solid, but a majority of frozen during the winter time. So diapause. Diapause is occurring in insects. An example of that is the IO moth. Um, they have, if you see that bottom uh, right-hand side, that's the pupa. So we have the caterpillar who's out in sp uh, late spring, summer, through fall, um, and then they pupate, and that pupa overwinters, and they start, they emerge as a moth in the spring and start the whole cycle over again. So they deal with winter time um, rather than trying to do all their, their full life cycle during one season and migrating like say our monarch butterflies do, they are gonna do it. They're gonna split it and basically go into diapause during the winter time and resume their development during the spring when it warms up and there's food. Um, the Carolina mantis also does the same thing. So they breed during the summer, lay their egg sacs in the fall, the eggs over winter. Um, and then they reemerge in spring and the whole cycle starts all over again. Uh, dragonflies and damselflies also experience this. Um, they may go into complete diapause or they may just kind of slow down for their, their naiads, their larval young, their aquatic larval young. And um, it just depends on where you are. So the farther south you go where they don't really are, they aren't as affected by cold weather you're gonna find that they're not having the issue where they really need to go to diapause and they can breed continuously. Versus up here, it's gonna slow down. Their young are basically, it's gonna to be too cold for them to really develop. They're gonna pretty much hang out, go to stay suspended animation as it warms up, resume their normal um, activities. So one of our big butterflies that hibernates, that goes into diapause during the winter months is gonna be our morning cloak. Um, they're gonna be the first ones we see during the spring. Um, we can see them as early as late March, which is, it's still pretty stinking chilly here in late March. So um, they're gonna be one of our first emergent butterflies because they're here year round. We don't have to wait for them to migrate this far north. So our morning cloaks we see in March, our monarch butterflies sometimes we don't see till 4th of July weekend. So that's the benefit of sometimes being able to, if you're able to, deal with the winter time, you can get a head start compared to some of the other um, species. But they tend to overwinter like in tree cavities, loose bark. Um, oftentimes they don't mind if it's covered by snow because snow is actually fairly insulating. And um, sometimes they even emerge before the snow is fully melted. So they're definitely one of the first butterflies you'll see on the wing in the spring. And now migration. So some don't even wanna deal with winter at all. They just, they. Their diet is just not conducive of surviving winter um, or just diapause is not a good enough strategy for them. So they migrate. migrate take, migration takes a ton of energy. Um, there's a ton of hazards along the way. Not only are you worried about getting eaten, you gotta find food along the way oftentimes. Um, and there's hazards that necessarily might not get eaten, but there are gonna be other hazards that may lead to you not surviving that full migration. Um, it can take monarch butterflies up to three separate generations to make it to their wintering grounds in Mexico. So it's it's a lot of work, but um, for insects, the monarchs are gonna be what the main, main migrators in this region. There's a lot of different other butterflies that do it as well, but monarchs are gonna be the big one. So torpor, um, the best example of this is the ruby-throated hummingbird. Now, what's really cool about the ruby throats, um, they are migrants, so they their torpor isn't tied necessarily to dealing with winter. Um, it is tied to like, as the weather cools down, even in the summertime, the, like the nights can get a little chilly sometimes. Um, they, they are basically on fast forward. Their metabolism is so, so high. Um, everything they do is fast, including their met metabolism. The problem is um, to keep 
their body temperature stable and to keep them basically in normal functioning uh, they, and cool nights, they literally may accidentally starve themselves to death by expending too much energy just trying to maintain their body temperature if they didn't go into torpor. So essentially they can drop their body temperature, which their average body temperature is about 105 degrees. So it's higher than us. Um, down to almost 70 degrees, depending on how cold the nights are, just kind of slow their metabolism down so they don't burn all their energy and essentially starve themselves to death overnight. So um, their heart rate slows down, their breathing slows down, everything kind of lowers. They're not burning that energy just to get through the cooler nights. So they're a pretty interesting species. They are migrants, so um, they can't overwinter here. It's too cold for them here. They're eating nectar, flowers are not blooming here in the winter time, so they do have to go travel south. But they're, everything's so much, runs so much faster for them just to survive cool nights here. They sometimes have to do what other animals do to deal with the winter time as well. And some animals, they don't need to do anything. They are adapted to be able to hunt and survive through the winter time. Um, most of them are mammals that, and specifically carnivores, uh, tend to be most active during the winter. Um, and they have a lot of different adaptations. So the red fox being one of the big ones, they grow their long winter coats that are much more insulating. So you can see the difference between the winter coat on the left and the fall, or sorry, the summer coat on the right. So they are able, basically, have more insulation to deal with the uh, winter weather. Um, they also are able to um, dig tunnels in the snow um, to not only help them find their food, but like in really bad weather conditions, they can basically go underground and wait it out and helps keep them warm. And um, they are so well adapted to dealing with the colder weather with their coats and stuff like they have dens, but they don't really need to stay in, to the, in them during the winter time to stay warm. So their long coats really do a great number to help keep them warm enough to deal with the winter. They're eating things like mice and voles and birds. So there is still food around for them to eat throughout the winter time as well. It might be a little bit harder to find, but it's enough to not have those pressures to be either a migrant or have some other adaptation to deal with winter. Bobcat, again, is another one um, that is able to deal with the winter by kind of going through uh, a little bit of body changes. They try to bulk up for the winter time. Um, they can also go through coat changes besides just the coat getting thicker and longer. It actually changes colors. Um, the coats tend to be more brown and tawny in the summertime to deal with, you know, a little bit better camouflage with the more dried grass. But they tend to get grayer in the winter time to look more like rocks or kind of things like that. So um, they give them better, a better chance of being more effective at uh, catching prey. And another one, oh, not wanting to go, but bobcats are pretty um, versatile in the winter. So for the most part, they're trying to find live food to eat, but they do not turn down carrion. Um, and oftentimes they'll have stores of food as well and foxes will do the same. Let's see what go with my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. So this another one uh, we more commonly seen than the bobcat or the fox is going to be our skunk. So uh, skunks are pretty neat. Um, they're smelly but they're pretty neat. So the striped skunks um, they don't hibernate but they kind of go through, it's like a mix of torpor um, and just inactivity. Um, they kind of den together. So you'll see like family groups um, with their, the offspring from that season, uh, spring season come and they'll kind of group up and overwinter and dense. And um, they are very, they're not as they're not as active for sure when it's cold. They kind of just live off the fat that they've stored throughout the season. However, um, they still on warmer days will go out and forage for food. 
a raccoon friends. So they can, they, they, uh, depending on how far north they are, will, will undergo torpor. Um, basically when the temperature is dropping like below 15, 10 degrees consistently, um, they will, that really triggers them to go to torpor. They can sleep for, or be inactive in that torpor state for weeks at a time, but they're relying on their, their stored fats. So unlike hibernation where everything is super duper, duper slow, torpor is lowered, but it's not, not to the extent that hibernation is. So they can only be inactive for so long because that, that stored fat is going to be used a lot quicker than if they truly hibernated. Another one of my favorite animals. They look a little rough, but I think they're pretty neat. Uh, the possum. Um, they have the roughest time of all the animals listed to deal with winter. Um, we're kind of towards the northern range. Um, that's because they are pretty poorly adapted to dealing with the cold. Um, oftentimes they get frostbite on their bald ears, their tail, their feet, their nose. Um, they don't like to din up together like they like skunks do. They oftentimes are basically using other dens or other unused cavities from other animals. Um, and they, they, will, they will gather materials and basically help insulate that den. But again, they aren't the best suited for dealing with winter. Um, even in areas that doesn't have harsh winters like we do, um, they're not a long-lived species in general. Usually two years is their maximum lifespan. They live about four years in captivity, two years in the wild. So they're not a long-lived species. Um, so having like migrating or dealing with full hibernation is not worth it, quote unquote, in the sense that they're still able to reproduce and um, spread their genetics effectively enough, um, even with their limited adaptations for dealing with our winter. So um, it, it's not worth the genetic and reproductive effort to do other methods of dealing with winter because they're not gonna live very long anyways. Um, but uh, oftentimes, so they're still gonna have to forage throughout the winter time, you'll see them usually under bird feeders and trash cans during this time of year because it is a lot harder for them to find food. Uh, however, they're super neat in the sense that they are resistant to rabies. So a big bonus there. And they also eat ticks like crazy. So they may look a little rough. Um, they might not live long, but they are um, pretty neat little animals that are beneficial to us. So bats, bats again have, um, they have, because they're so small and because they're flighted, they have a really high surface area ratio to their body size. So they can get cold really easy because there's so much basically more exposed of them to get cold. So some bats do hibernate. Um, you're going to see that with the, uh, these bats listed, like the Indian, uh, the little brown, the big brown, um, the purpose trail, but they are going to be more, you're going to find them in caves and some abandoned mines is another one. Sometimes they'll do like cracks and rocks and outcropping. Um, the red bat, which isn't listed here, they will occasionally, very, very occasionally um, hibernate in trees, but for the most part, they're going to be migratory. So the silver, red, and hoary bats are migratory. So they're going to go move down south to deal with winter time rather than uh, risk hibernation. Um, the big risk for hibernation for uh, any of our animals is that they are inactive, they cannot move. They're basically in a state of deep sleep, which makes them vulnerable. Um, and a big issue that our hybrid, our bats that stay here and hibernate because they're doing in caves um, is the white nose syndrome. It's the fungus that can affect them. Uh, it can cause them to wake up too early during their hibernation and basically they starve. So um, there's some risks when you decide to stay for hibernation, just like migration has some potential um, risks of death, so does hibernation. 
So the Eastern chipmunk, um, they, they go, they, they don't fully hibernate truly like some of our other animals do, but they get very, very close. Um, they can go from their heart rate, which is crazy high, like 300 all the way down to four beats per minute. Uh, but they do wake up periodically to eat uh, stored food and to go to the bathroom. So a tr an animal that's truly hibernating will not be waking up. So they're kind of like a mix of extreme torpor and hibernation. You're also going to find this with the black bear. Um, they basically fatten up to deal with the winter time. And that is a big, big um, important factor in hibernation. Basically, they have to prepare to hi hibernate. They can't just go at their normal weight and hibernate. They actually have to be prepared for the winter. And usually that means fat fatting them up. So they're eating different foods that usually are higher in fats and higher in protein. Um, so the bears go from eating um, anything ranging from like fish all the way through to plants and berries. They're going to be going in and fall and eating a whole bunch of insects. Um, they might even get to the point where they're uh, trying to capture deer. Um, and again, bears aren't picky. They're going to um, eat carrion to dead things as well. Uh, so they, there's a really strong drive in the fall to consume as much as physically possible to get ready for that winter. And um, they, as they get through the winter um, and come spring, uh, depending on how much they were able to eat, they can almost basically be starving by the time they wake up. So they're very vulnerable when spring arrives, but um, the, as long as they get enough through the winter time or through the fall to get them through winter, usually they're okay. So the true hibernators and what we have a day to celebrate is our groundhog, also known as the woodchuck. Um, they're actually technically a ground squirrel um, they can climb trees, but they actually specifically, their body temperature drops from about 100 degrees all the way down to as low as 37 degrees. So they really are taking it basically to the lowest levels. Um, breathing will go from about 16 breaths per minute to as few as two breaths per minute. And because they're true hibernators, they will lose no more than a fourth of their body weight through the winter. So because their, body, their metabolism slows so far down um, that they do still have to fatten up to get ready, but versus the bears, which can lose a huge chunk of their body weight, almost up to 50%, they only lose about a fourth. So they are true, true hibernators and they get a whole day to celebrate them. So the ground, the groundhog, which another one of my favorite names for him is the whistle pig because of the sound that they make. They actually whistle and they kind of look like a pig. Um, their legend is, you know, if they emerge from the burrow and on this day and they fail to see the shot, their shadow because the weather is cloudy, um, winter will end soon. And then, but if they see their shadow, the shadow, they return to the burrow and we have six more weeks of winter. So there's that whole groundhog, uh, Tony Phil, there's there's a lot of lot of celebration around our true hibernator, the groundhog. So, um, and the predictions aren't really super duper accurate in terms of the winter being harsher or not. But the funny part is that technically it doesn't matter what six more weeks of winter, six more weeks of spring. Technically, spring starts six weeks after this February second. So. You're going to get spring either way, whether or not the weather indicates it such is a different story. So here's some fun facts about our groundhogs. Um, again, they're true hibernators um, and they basically can pretty much chill out for up to three months. So uh, they can drop their temperature, like I mentioned, it's low as 37 degrees. Um, we get hypothermia if our body temperature, we get mild hypothermia if our body temperature just drops three degrees. So it's pretty crazy to see the difference between they can almost take their body to freezing and three degrees, we're starting to get issues with our body. Um, again, we lose consciousness at 82 and we can die at 70. So um, you have 80 beats per minute going down to about five 
for their heart rate, 16 breaths per minute to fuse two. And they don't eat for almost 150 days, which is just crazy. I can't even imagine it. But again, they're only, they're losing no more than a fourth of their body weight just because of how their metabolism is so lowered during hibernation. And that's the big thing. Hibernation is, is truly the, you're changing your metabolism. It is hormonal. It is not temperature dependent, it is hormone dependent. And usually that is tied to daylight hours. Um, they, again, have to eat a ton of stuff to get ready for hibernation. And I like this fun fact of 155, 150 pound man scarfing a 15 pound steak to get prepared for hibernation. So they might eat up to a pound of vegetation in one sitting. So pretty intense eating and in, just to get ready for their um, winter plumes, essentially. Their teeth have to grow to accommodate that. So it, they can grow up to 16 16th of an inch each week, which is just crazy. Um, and uh, they have to be careful those that are ma- like their mouth isn't properly lined up. They can actually have really big issues, um, either starving to death or basically impale either the upper or lower jaw because of that. Um, their burrows can be as six, deep as six feet and go 20 feet or more underground. They have like this whole extensive amount of tunnels. Usually they have two entrances or more just so they have like a backup entrance and the escape plan. And um, burrows are their big way to escape. Um, they aren't, they are, they're fast, but they're not the quickest, especially in fall. Um, they're a little bit chunky, so they can't run very fast um, going from more like the 10, 15 mile per hour range to top speed of only eight mile per hour when they are um, getting prepared for their winter hibernation. So, and again, a fox can go up to 25. So they really rely on those burrows to deal with uh, their escape plans so they can actually get to the point to hibernate and not get eaten. So those are my fun facts about hibernation. Do we have any questions? I'm sorry, I know through a whole bunch of information about it to everyone. I have asked all of you to unmute in case you do have questions, if that makes it a little easier for you. And no questions is totally fine. Um, <laughs> Yeah, our, and the thing to look out for right, right now, our groundhogs are going hard to get ready for winter. Um, we have one that is definitely about 14 pounds. It is looks like a sumo wrestler right now. So definitely look out for those groundhogs um, and watch their really fun uh, preparation behavior. Does, right. this well, rain, does this rain interfere with them now, the groundhogs? Um, just it really depends for the flooding that's an issue they'll still forage in the rain um as long as it doesn't get too too cold because they uh, their their bodies are starting to slow down but they haven't slowed down to the extent of like hibernation by any means so they can still get hyperthermia at this point so they have to be careful but they will still there's just such an innate um ingrained um push to forage right now to get ready for winter that they'll still be feeding in the rain. All right, well, if there are no more questions, any other questions? Thank you. No, no, thank you for joining me today. Yes, we won't see Lauren for a couple months, but she will be back probably around spring, late winter, spring. All right, thank you. Absolutely. And thank you so much for having me. And I look forward to you see, seeing you y'all back in into February. So yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you all for joining. Have a great day. Thank you. You as well. Bye.